live, by the way. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's do this. <laughs> We're live. You're hilarious. I was like, <laughs> I've had it happen before where my guest was late and I just filled the space with talking about things, but it's all fine. You're I here. knew, I knew you would be here because you are you and I am me. This is our, my, our, the collective hour back to me podcast. And I, yesterday I was a little bit stressed because I was like, oh, my guest can't make it. What am I going to do? And as I posted earlier, just another door will open. And I actually am super excited that I get to talk to the one and only Rod McDonald, <laughs> because I think you are an outstanding human being. And I think everybody should know all about you and why you're so outstanding. But um, yeah, so and because I know that you are also a huge proponent of wellness. So I am ever so grateful for you to jump on with me. And I was telling people this morning in my class, not only is he amazing, but he's my coach, which makes him even more amazing. <laughs> so well, You're not supposed to make me cry in the first like four minutes of the, <laughs> of the podcast. So. People don't usually, well, sometimes people do cry, but only because they're so happy, right? <laughs> we make it sound like crying is bad. Crying's not necessarily bad. No, crying's good. Right. So release. So my friend, I didn't, I didn't get to post a, a bio about you. So let's have, I know it's a long, it's a, it's a long history. Sometimes mine can go on forever, but, um, and, it, it, and I've heard you introduce yourself before in courses. So give us a brief Rod McDonald. Well, um, I'll give you the briefest one, which is what I, what I tend to go with because, um, when I'm when I'm setting up like a new profile on something, I'll be like, I'm a guy doing something somewhere. <laughs> That's it. So no, That's but pretty more, brief. Formally, <laughs> more formally, uh, I am the CEO of the Certified Coaches Federation (CCF). Um, I have done a lot of different things over my life. I've been very blessed and very fortunate to be able to uh, travel. I've been a speaker on stages uh, across Canada, the United States, China, Australia, New Zealand. Um, I'm a published author. Uh, I am a coach, as you said, uh, which is really what I feel is my calling um, to be a coach and, and to some extent or as an extension to be a teacher. And um, but the foundation of that, which actually this I don't actually put this into my bio formally, um, is that as a coach and a teacher, the foundation is that I'm a student. Um, and that is because I, I have a passion for human behavior and for all things about why people do what they do or don't do what they should do um, when they want to get from where they are to where they want to be in their lives. And um, there's a bunch of other little things, little other accomplishments and stuff like that. But um, I'm really happy to be here with you because I think you're an outstanding human being. Uh -huh. And um, when I saw, yeah, we'll, we'll have a little cry fest together. <laughs> you're the best. <laughs> but when I saw that um, you, you needed uh, a hand, uh, I said, "Yeah, absolutely." You're so awesome. And you know, you're like, "Yeah, I did a few other things." Well, you know, I cycled all the way across Canada. I did, you know, an Ironman. I. <laughs> have some fabulous children, <laughs> you know, so yes, you have done tons. And I, I love the, because I think this is where we align all the time. It's like, yeah, we like to teach people, but mostly it's a bit um, selfish. I find sometimes because every time I teach people something, I learn something new and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so great. I hope you're having as much fun as I am <laughs> doing this kind of thing. Right. So yeah, that's amazing. And the it is true, like so many people that I see, you want to help them. And for me, coaching is how I can help people get out of that stuck spot, right? And what do you find, because you've studied humans a lot, and our human nature, what do you find? Is there a common denominator of what gets people stuck? Uh, always themselves, um, and and second would be other people. 
Um, <laughs> it's pretty broad. <laughs> yeah. Third would be, you know, their context or whatever. But, you know, but I, I say that sort of half jokingly. And, and like you, I, it's like I have a secondary bank account, you know, obviously, I have to get paid so that I can, you know, pay the mortgage and, and whatnot. But um, the secondary bank account is that sort of energetic bank account of good vibes, if you will, that, you know, when I get the, the, you know, wonderful blessing to work with someone because they've asked uh, to do so, then the bank account fills up, the energetic bank account fills up. When they have a breakthrough, the bank account fills up. When they have a realization or an insight, or they've accomplished something that they wanted to accomplish, then, then that energetic bank account fills up. Um, so, but coming back to your question of, you know, the common denominator, um, you know, I, I think that there's broadly a, a few denominators, let's say, uh, that that hold some people back. Sometimes it's it's a variation of fear. So some people will call it hesitation or, or uh, trepidation or uh, a need for more knowledge or a need for more money or a need for more time. But often that's just the, the underpinnings of that is some level of fear about what might happen if they... Uh, don't accomplish what they want to accomplish, or in some cases, if they do accomplish what they they want to accomplish and what that might mean, because um, that shows up quite a bit. But, you know, you've probably heard me say that there's sort of broadly two reasons um, why people don't achieve their goals. And and I say this again, sort of kind of half jokingly, because I, I mean it, but I, I sort of, I mean it playfully, but I also mean it quite seriously, which is, the, the first bucket is like, it's impossible, right? That the thing they want actually cannot be achieved either in the time they want it to be achieved or the way they want it to be achieved or, or something like that. But there's very few things that actually sort of fall into that bucket of actually impossible because even things like, like time frame that then moves over to the other second bucket, which is it's not important enough to you. Because right. If something's really important to you, you will find a way. And um, and I think that people get stuck on the things that are important to them in the moment and and less focused on the things that, that may be important to them in the long term. And I think so the impossible bucket, sometimes we've made the bucket impossible because, and maybe this is what you meant, like the time parameters. It's like, I want to weigh, this is just an easy example, right? Yeah. It's the, I want to lose 50 pounds in five days. There's, yeah. this, that's to which, kind of- to which I respond, pick an arm. <laughs> right? <You know? laughs> pick a limb. Amputate. <laughs> I just saw, I, I, I don't know if you saw, can you see the chat box? Can you see? I Nick? do not uh, see, oh no, there. There's there, Nicole is like, she's hey, her favorite celebrity. And yes, we are both speaking to you again, Nicole. This is especially for you. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> kidding, kidding, kidding. Um, but yes, it's like we, and I think it's a fear thing um, that we make a, put a parameter on our goal that we ensure that we can't do it. Yep. Right? Look, I told you I couldn't do it. So... Um, we do it to ourselves. <laughs> we, we, we're really good. And this is sort of the double-edged sword of being these uh, basically cave people with 21st century prefrontal cortexes that um, we're really good at strategizing and, and coming up with how to do things. But the, the cave person desires sabotage us all the time. Whether that's, you know, somebody trying to lose weight and it's that, you know, emotional uh, eating or somebody who wants to make exercise a, a bigger uh, part of their lives. And uh, but they stay on the couch because, you know, something on Netflix is so engaging and, and they feel like they're going to get a medal if they it's like an Olympic event, if they can finish a season in one sitting or something. Right. Oh my gosh. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, finding the things in the moment that sabotage us, to, that take us away from the accomplishments we could have if we, if we could just sort of let go of some of those momentary needs 
to actually put uh, to to invest in uh, the time and effort to go forward with something bigger and better in the long term. Is it is it our you know caveman brain that also wants the instant gratification? Like if I can't have it now, it's not worth working for. Does, do you have an opinion on that? I um. <laughs> I don't think it's. I don't think that that's the caveman brain. I think that's more the uh, the emotional brain, uh, which is sort of has one foot in the caveman side and one foot in the in the modern side. Um, there is that that sort of sense of, you know, I I want it, and I think it's a song, right? It's like a nineteen eighties or nineties like heavy metal song. I want it, and I want it now, or something like that. Um, yeah, I remember that song actually. <laughs> <laughs> Super Tramp or something. I don't know. But, Nicole will know. Nicole, yeah. Google it for us. It's an Olympic event. Yeah. So, um, you know, but but we are emotional creatures, right? And so we we want what we want and we want it now and we don't want to wait. And if it's too tough, then I guess I'll go and have the other thing that makes me feel better and whatever that is. And for some people, that's that's food or drugs or alcohol or whatever other thing that may or may not rise to the level of an addiction, but it certainly fires us up in a certain way um, and makes us feel good for a certain amount of time. Right. And what was in the other bucket? Now I've so queen, the, queen. It, it was queen. I want it all. Yeah. Was I it? Knew Nicole yeah. would know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> there she is. Yeah. <laughs> What's a, okay. What was in the other bucket? So it's, it's either impossible, meaning like impossible, it actually, right. actually can't be achieved. Like if somebody said, you know, at, you know, let's say at the age of 60 um, and they have uh, osteoarthritis and osteoporosis and, and they have all kinds of different conditions and they said, yeah, I'm going to go win the gold medal in the 100 meter dash in the Olympics, right? Like that's probably as close to as uh, impossible as you're going to get because there are certain things that while we might like to say, hey, you can do it it's not realistic. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and so there are certain sports activities, achievements that really are geared towards other people, but there is something called the master's games. And so maybe that 60 year old with the osteoarthritis and osteoporosis can go and get a gold medal, maybe in their age group in the master's games, um, which is, which is the biggest, I believe it's the biggest sporting event outside the Olympics. And they oh. always follow the Olympics by a year or two in the same venues. They sort of, they, they ride the coattails, if you will, of, of the Olympics. So, Why reinvent the wheel? Yeah. <laughs> so it's interesting. So I have this, and this came to me because I have the post-it note just sitting right here from the mastermind that I did with Mike Chambers recently. And when you've probably heard him say this, it's like, and it has to do with that fear thing. Your ego only sees what it can lose, never what you can gain. Mm -hmm. So, and I've mentioned this before. I can't remember when because I've been talking a lot <laughs> online lately. But uh, it's like we get stuck in that uh, the devil we know versus the devil we don't know. I don't want to change something. What if I, what if I don't like where it goes? What if it's what if it proves that I do suck at something? What if I what if, the the what ifs or the uh yeah that's a different topic that's something I, else well, yeah, i agree with that and and i think you know i was talking to somebody just recently about this um about how uh you know when you do something or you try something or you you know jump into something or you make a, an effort towards something sometimes people are afraid of the failure right that they're going to be embarrassed or uh they won't accomplish it or or whatever the case may be um but if we if we're able to, in a sense, sort of talk to ourselves and say, okay, it's not going to be failure. I'm just going to learn something. And almost at a, at a fundamental level, we have to say, well, am I going to die because of this? Like if, if I try this, like if I'm going to, if I start this business, if I, if I go ask that person on a date, if I, you know, go and try this new, you know, uh, yoga class or whatever, and am I going to die by doing those things? Okay. Probably not, you know, barring an asteroid like crashing probably down not yeah you know. that moment <laughs> um so so i can i can let go of that level of fear because some people get hijacked by that it's a, it's the feeling even though they wouldn't label it as I'm, i think i'm going to die it's a fear that sort of is on that level uh for them for some people and then 
Uh, and then it's fear of the ego, the embarrassment or the what they, they consider failure. And at that point, you, again, you can have that conversation with yourself around, is that realistic or can I, and this is one of my favorite words, can I transmogrify that fear? Calvin and Hobbes. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Calvin and Hobbes, my, my favorite cartoon ever. Um, can I transmogrify that fear? Because fear is just an emotion, right? Like it's not a physical thing that you can weigh, that you can identify, but but we feel it. Oh my gosh, it feels pretty real, doesn't it? Feels it feels pretty real, right? But it's just a feeling. And so we can transmogrify fear into um, anticipation, maybe. We can trans we can transmogrify it into excitement, maybe. We can harness that energy, re really. We can harness that energy to make a bigger effort. But we often, because we don't have, most people don't have a good sense of themselves, self-awareness, they don't know how to do that. And we're not typically taught this. Um, as we grow up. And so we go by what feels good or the avoidance of what might feel bad without thinking through, you know, using the 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 frontal prefrontal cortex and all that logic to then speak to that emotional part of ourselves. Say, well, I'm not going to die. I can change this into excitement and anticipation and I'm just going to do it anyway. And the, the very simple version of that would be something like as a kid going up to the three meter or 10 meter diving board and just stepping off, right? Not trying to do a big like Olympic dive or whatever, but just that fear that our bodies say, this is scary, right? That's That feels real, but then they'll step off and there might be a, a level of terror when they, when they step off, but when they you know hit the water and they come back up from the water they're like that was awesome i didn't like, die <laughs> yeah, i didn't die um <clears throat> and as long as they weren't hurt or whatever or traumatized by it then it's awesome and they're like i want to do it again and so sometimes it's just that it's it's taking that step and believing and having in a sense a, a non-religious type of faith a faith in self to say i'm going to be okay and i'm actually going to be better now I just have to take that step and welcome that that better into my life after after I do it. Right. Um, it just reminded me. So I teach uh, beginner. I teach level one kayaking in the summer. And one of the first things we have to get them to do is to teach them how to get out of the kayak when it's upside down. Right. And I there is no, there is zero danger in it. Like there is absolutely zero danger in it because I'm standing next to them. Right. And even if they can't figure out how to get out, I'm there and I take them out. You know, it's like, I'll give you about five seconds before I'm going to pull you out of the water, even though I know you can hold your breath for longer. But I have, I literally spent 90 minutes with someone before they could even try and yeah. they knew how to swim. Yeah. And they knew they weren't going to be, they knew intellectually they weren't going to be trapped, but somehow it's like breaking the physicalness, transmogrifying that physical fear. I saw on your Facebook page that you have Calvin there yelling at the world. Um, uh, trans, like sometimes we can let that, that uh, I don't want to call it an emotion because I guess it's kind of an emotion, but that feeling rule us, right? And that can stop you from doing so many things, so many things. Um, and Nicole, I saw that you asked me to repeat the quote, so I put it in the chat box. Let me know if you can't see it. But, and I mean, I did it myself for a very long time. I was scared as crap to do a lot of things. But something in me, some self, I don't know, torture <laughs> made me go and do things anyway. And then I would do that. I'd go, oh my God, I didn't die. Okay, well, I guess I could do it again. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. <laughs> it's, like you know, it's little it's, steps. It's interesting you say that <clears throat> because it sounds a little similar to a thought process or a belief that I have, which has really served me well. Um, and I, I recommend it, when it whenever it's applicable to my clients, to friends and family and so on, which is 
if somebody else can do it, chances are you can, or you can do a variation of it, right? So um, maybe a, I've done the Ironman triathlon, maybe that's not for everybody, but maybe a try a try or a sprint course triathlon is within what they can do, right? And if you look at anything from like learning to salsa dance or to, to do a triathlon or to get your master's degree or, you know, start a business or whatever it is, um, if someone else has done it and someone else has done everything pretty much, if someone else has done it, then uh, as the saying goes, success leaves clues. Just look at what they did, model that behavior, and chances are you're going to accomplish some version, your version of the same thing. Something that came into my brain earlier and then just came back and left and then came back again um, when we were talking is, and I've, I've said this to my clients, I mean, they want to do something new, but they want to be perfect at it the first time. And I mean, I don't know anybody who perfects something the first time they do it. I mean, I'm still working on, you know, it's like a continually going, oh, I could have done that better. I could have done that better. But we're so hard on ourselves. Like, I don't know where it came from that we expect ourselves to already know how to do something as soon as we decide to do it. Obviously, I have to be good at it and be the gold medal winner, Nicole. Nicole's <laughs> going to win the gold. <laughs> you know, I, I think you're, I think you're bang on with that. I think that um, in this day and age, we have a tendency to see the highlight reels, and we compare our struggle or our fear of even starting with the highlight reel. And what we don't hardly ever see is the hard work and the struggle and the failure of what it took to get to the highlight reel. And so, you know, you hear things like, you know, Michael Jordan was cut from his high school basketball team and, you know, Tiger Woods, you know, he he would routinely every day hit a bucket of a full bucket of golf balls with each club in his golf bag. You know, the, the level of work and effort that is put into getting to that highlight reel is more than most people would be willing to undergo, but that's okay because they don't have to try to be the next Michael Jordan or Venus Williams or-, or They don't wanna be maybe, right? right. But, but they can have their own version of whatever they wanna call it, success or, or you know, blessing or whatever. And I think, cause I just <clears throat> found myself guilty of it right then when you mentioned Tiger Woods and Michael Jordan, and I had to catch myself and catch my catch my own self talk. Yes, they did all that, but you know, all of the shots that they made were obviously good every single time. They just hit a lot of them. <laughs> this is my sassy voice inside, right? <laughs> so, and I know that's completely not true. And I know that they all they don't have perfect games and they missed lots of shots and when they first started, they didn't know how to play. And I mean, we always coach our clients, you know, don't compare your beginning to someone else's middle but i think that like we maybe it's I, like it's pretty easy to blame social media for all of our problems but and maybe it's not like you use the highlight reel but maybe it is that you know we see everyone else's perfect in quotation marks because life we're like oh everything they do is perfect so why should i even bother well, it's it's rare that people want to want to share the what they would call maybe their low light reel, right? Um, the stuff that they would like to keep in the dark or in the shadow, or that feels like it's in their their heart's shadow, if you will, of of you know failures or whatever. And I think that we have an opportunity as coaches to help people understand that that's just part of the um, part of the the process is to um, you know, fall down and get back up. And that's that's one of my other favorite quotes, the, the, the Japanese proverb of uh, fall down seven times, get up eight times. <laughs> like it's 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 so simple, right? Which is why it is uh, so powerful um, that- They're uh, smart, those proverb people. <laughs> <laughs> the, the proverb people, yeah. <laughs> and, and so it's okay to fall down, just get up, you know? Um, 
I, I think it's Japanese. The I like the wabi-sabi. It's not a proverb. It's just kind of a way of being the wabi-sabi. It's like perfection and imperfection. I mean, it's the, they view something as more precious if it's been broken. Yes. Right. And it still works great and it's still fine. And look, it's had a life experience. So I'm like, oh my God, I'm a, I'm so wabi sabi. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm cool with that. I'll fill myself with gold in all my cracks, yeah. you know? Yeah. And it, there's, um, I've, I've, we've probably talked about her before. I read the Jen Sincero book and uh, she calls the ego, the little prince. <laughs> and that it's always stamping its feet and wanting its way and won't let you do anything different because it wants things its way. And um, the other thing that I had come to mind is I took this, uh, I went to participate, a woman was having, uh, was just launching her art therapy business and I went to her group workshop and we were um, doing this exercise to silence our inner critic. It was all about like squashing the inner critic, but I pref because that's impossible. I feel like that is impossible. That's not a that's not a thing. He probably even the Dalai Lama has an inner critic somewhere. And I thought of it as when I t when I talk to my inner voice because I talk to my inner voice. I recognize that it's an early version of me who had their bejeebies scared out of them for some reasons and it could have been something totally innocuous like I still have a memory of one when I was like 12 where a girl was pointing and laughing and I was sure she was laughing at me that still is with me and so it's like don't let anybody see you they'll point and laugh but then I just say I realize that my inner voice is a very early version of me who's scared crapless and is trying to protect me from having that experience again so instead of telling my inner voice to shut up, um, I just thank it for trying to take care of me and, and reassure it, put my arm around it, reassure it. It's okay. I'm not going to yeah. die. Right. <laughs> and, you know, I love that, that imagery <clears throat> of putting your arm around that, that, you know, uh, inner self or the younger self. <clears throat> and I think, and th that sort of is a great sort of semi segue into the notion that as coaches we play a certain role and then there's an, there's other professionals we can work with for different things i go to my chiropractor for my back and and whatnot but you look at things like psychotherapy and and if there's if there's actual real trauma there that needs to be addressed recognized and healed then you know that's a that's a great way to do that is to go to psychotherapy and and do that um, but as coaches, you know, we're not psychotherapists. What we do is we make that distinction that, you know, generally speaking, psychotherapy is looking at the past up to now, and we're looking at the now and what's next. And so in the same way that you're saying, you know, let me put my arm around that younger self and say, hey, it's going to be okay. You know, you don't need to be scared anymore or whatever the, the feeling is. But then we also need to welcome the older version of ourself that hasn't had the next experience yet right oh future heather yeah yeah <laughs> she has a name i call her future heather future heather yeah I, like i put treats in the fridge for future heather <laughs> <laughs> so you know you can you can say you know what i i'm gonna have future heather put her arm around me and say hey do the thing you're scared of now because it's going to be okay because i know it's going to be okay because hey i'm future heather right that's brilliant wow, I just thought I was treating future Heather. I never had the flip to have, I didn't transmogrify that thought to have <laughs> future Heather come back and talk to me. It's it's a very powerful thing. It's And and I think we've we've either talked about this, I may have gone through this with you, is, is that to have that conversation, you can actually have a conversation with that future self. Um, you know, and, and whenever we have those moments of <clears throat> of challenge or difficulty or doubt, we can sit quietly, we can lie down, we can kind of go for a walk with this and, and imagine that we can have this conversation with the version of ourselves that I, the way I like to, to frame this is the version of yourself that is older and wiser and has accomplished pretty much everything you want to accomplish in your life. And 
they they have nothing but serenity and happiness because of every experience they've had. And you get to talk to this older version of yourself and say, hey, what should I do now? And am I going to be okay? Or whatever the question is that you're feeling, should I should I start this or whatever? And there's a there's an inherent wisdom that we can access by just asking that question. And the the cool, awesome thing about it is you're still just talking to yourself, <laughs> right? You're not actually talking to a future version. Wear earbuds so people don't realize you're <laughs> yeah. So it's it's a it's a wonderful gift to give yourself that you can talk to yourself and um and have a conversation. And the answers are always supportive and pure because they they will do nothing but support you because they are you they'll never lie to you they'll never uh betray you they'll never do all the the things that we fear other people will do to us um they'll always give us the right answer right i and i think i mentioned this once in one of our mastermind groups that one of the ways because i just realized like i will have conversations i don't know if it's my if i don't know if it's future heather but i will in a journal, write with my dominant hand, my question, and with my non-dominant hand, I'll write the answer. And it sounds a bit crazy that you, I don't know what the, the right, because I'm left-handed, I don't know what my right hand is often going to say when I'm writing. But when I read it, I go, wow, that's fascinating. Mm. Tell me more. But it is a way of asking, I mean, some people will talk to themselves. Um, but if you're not a talk out loud to yourself person, then you could have a write it down person. And don't judge yourself on your non-dominant handwriting because it's just perfect the way it is. Um, but there are, it is true. Like I've had those um, things happen where, and they weren't all, some of them were conversations, some of them were facilitated with other people. So I had a therapist who, I had a conversation with myself. I actually physically changed chairs back right. and forth. Yep. And he said, you looked different as you changed chairs. Your voice changed and your demeanor changed. And it's fascinating the answers you already know. Because, I, I mean, you and I know that we already know the answers yeah. that we're looking for. Even I know that I know the answers, but I often have a conversation with you to help me figure out what the answer is. Rod, I know the answer. Could you just tell me what I was, what <laughs> I need to tell myself? <laughs> but I think, because uh, I this always comes into my head, no man is an island. And I think it's because um, sometimes we have our blinders on and did we put them there on purpose? Like, where did they come from? And we need someone else to kind of shine the light. Uh, my anatomy teacher once said to me that I should be the lighthouse, not the lifeboat, because I kept trying to save everyone. I'm like, but I can see what they're doing and they can't see it. So helping shine people's lights, like turn on the lights for people, open the curtains, polish the window, whatever metaphor you want to use, um, is like one of the, you know, for we're filling our buckets by, by turning on the lights for other people. Yeah. And it's like, um, and my, mine is often, I'm often, I guess, drawn onto the wellness sphere because I, f I feel like uh, if people feel well, and I do use the wellness wheel, although I've been changing it. I mean, and I talked about that on Wednesday, actually, the wellness wheel, the, the six, petals of my wellness flower that we do always even I do it my mind immediately goes to physical but there's other things in that and sometimes we do just need someone to say it doesn't matter if you can do an iron man you know how do you feel when was the last time you went out with your friends because of all those different aspects of what you need I I feel like I don't want to say balance because I feel like people feel like it's impossible to be balanced. Well, it's it's um, it is a type of balance, right? In the same way that, you know, if you take and, and you know, we as coaches, we talk in analogies and metaphors and things. So it's a little bit like the tightrope walker that um, 
you know, I guess the I guess the more modern version of that would be the slack rope or slack line. Right. Walker, right? I'm terrible at that. <laughs> um, yeah, me too. I am. <laughs> um, it's but it's not terrible, right? It's it's we just haven't put the effort into it. I haven't practiced enough. Yeah. So, um, but it's in any one moment if you took a photo of somebody on a tightrope or a slack line, they're gonna look like you know one leg's over there, one arm's up here. And, and they're going to look out of balance, but that's because you just took that one snapshot. And in fact, that's a snapshot of 10 million snapshots or, you know, 10 trillion snapshots in their life or in that time or whatever. And, and no one snapshot gives you the full, you know, experience of what actually was happening and, and the wind and the, the crowd and the, you know, thoughts and feelings and the line and, and everything. Um, and so I think that, that we get scared of the snapshot of us being out of balance because we think that's what people are going to see is that we're out of balance, but it's, it's us making our way across the line. And as long as we get across the line, um, then, it doesn't matter if we if we had one arm out one way and the leg the other leg the other way we're just making our way across in whatever shifting balance that we need to 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 have and embrace to get to where we want to get to and nothing ever stays static so even if you did find that perfect balance like it's i mean on the slack line I, does wind affect you on a slack line i don't know but <laughs> i mean life is always doing that movement nothing stays the same, you know, people, events, whether um, I had my group coaching on Tuesday night with my group of ladies and all of them were saying they were feeling better. I'm like, I wonder if part of it is because it's the light. I mean, not that we can't take, give credit to ourselves for doing the work because they were doing amazing work, by the way, they were doing super amazing. By the way, if they're listening, you guys did awesome. But um, part of it is, like, yeah, there's so many things around us that affect us. When we're feeling down, is it something in us or something around us that needs to change, right? And being able to recognize that. And first, recognizing, second, doing something. <clears throat> yeah, and it's, it's, um, it's often just a little thing to do, right? And we we sometimes get scared by the immensity, what we believe to be the immensity of the thing that we want to do, need to do, think other people want us to do. And really, it's just one thing. It's it's that first, you know, put the feet out of the bed. And then it's like, whatever the next thing is, right? Just pick the next thing and do the next little thing. And don't worry so much about the outcome. You might be wanting to go in that general direction to get that outcome. But you know, and, and it's, um, you know, like the book Atomic Habits, right? It's all these teeny little things that build up to allow us to create the life that we want. And if we if we look back, we actually can find that that blue those blueprints, not just one blueprint, but there's there's hundreds, if not thousands of blueprints that we've actually used in all these other areas of our lives. You know, whether it was getting through high school or college, university or you know, getting through a tough relationship or, you know, uh, losing a job or whatever it is and say, okay, well, what, what was the first thing that I did? And what was the second thing? And let me then clean that up. I'll take out the things that weren't such, such great choices, but then what was left of that? And maybe, maybe I can take that blueprint that actually I, I obviously used 10 years ago, 20 years ago and bring that to today say, okay, well, okay, to, to get that promotion that I wanted 20 years ago, what did I do? I got up early, I stayed up late, I, I, you know, talked to the people I had to talk to, I worked really hard, I had other people give me advice and, and say, okay, well, that's a great strategy. So let's bring all that forward to today. If you wanted to, not a promotion, but if today you wanted to make yoga part of your life, well, could you apply some, if not all that strategy? Could you get up a little bit earlier and do a, a morning practice? Could you do an evening practice? Could you talk to people about how they got into yoga and apply the same strategy to this new thing? <clears throat> you almost certainly would achieve it, but we tend to forget all those successes 
because we're in the state of, oh, I'm probably going to suck or I'm probably going to, you know, hurt myself or whatever. And a lot of times we never actually celebrated that we did something amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Because we don't recognize our amazingness. Yeah. And, and we want to move on to the next thing. Yeah. It's like, I'm done. Okay. What's next? Uh, no. And then if people try to congratulate you, no, 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 that was, that was before and that was nothing. But when you were talking about the getting out of bed, it reminded me of Nicole because I talked to Nicole last month and she said, she called it sitting in the mud puddle. She said, when you recognize you're sitting in the mud puddle, the first step is to stand up or yeah. the first step is to recognize that you can stand up. It's yeah. like, yeah. And then, then you go, okay, what's next? But I think people get stuck because they just see where they're the end point and they're like, it's too far. That's too far away. I can't. I can't get there. It's just impossible. There's our impossible bucket. We're back to the impossible bucket. Yeah. <clears throat> but and and uh, and Lao Tzu's quote, right? Of a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. One right? step. I mean, if if it worked hundreds or I guess it would be hundreds of years ago, like still works now, right? We're still the same as we were a hundred years ago. Yeah. Apparently, <laughs> you know, we just have better technology to yeah. be the same as we were, and. Oh my God, something just flew in and out. Did you see it go? <laughs> Sometimes you got to grab those ideas. They're just so fast. Um, journey of a thousand steps, blah, blah, blah. No, it's gone. It's 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 about getting started, right? Figuring yes. out what it, what's the first thing that I can do. What's an easy thing? What's a simple thing? A little thing that I can do and not judge. And this is another one is like, don't judge someone's finish to your start, right? Right. With your middle. And just do the little thing. You know, there, there was a client that I worked with who had a gym membership, was paying for a gym membership for like four years, but wasn't going. And I said, and she wanted to go back to the gym because she liked the classes, but she felt like she had sort of slid backwards in terms of her, her progress. And I said, well, could you drive past the gym? Right. You know, like, <laughs> just, yeah, I could do that. Or maybe she already, she already was, but it's like, well, could you go and park at the gym in the parking lot? I don't care if it's at the other end of the parking lot, but just just get there and then go home. And if that feels good, then tomorrow, why don't you park closer? Or why don't you go into the gym and pick up a schedule? Or, you know, just do whatever the next little thing is, right, to get to the, a little bit further. And, um, and eventually she went back to the gym. So That's cool. Yeah. This is... It's kind of the same, but not. I remember one time somebody, their their, ch their child wouldn't floss their teeth. So their parents said, okay, just floss one tooth. So it depends how stubborn the child is. But, you know, okay, I've lost one tooth, going to bed. You know, eventually you, they come to the, well, why am I just doing one? Maybe I'll do two kind of thing. Like you just <laughs> build yourself up to it. So you're like, that actually wasn't that hard. Yeah. Like that actually wasn't that hard. It can feel overwhelming to floss your teeth maybe at night when you're tired, but floss one tooth and then the next one and then the next one. But it is true. Sometimes you feel, so one of my favorite yoga teachers who you might know, Ian Finn. Do you know Ian Finn? I don't. Oh my gosh, you don't know Ian Finn? <sighs> I'll introduce you someday. Um, <clears throat> but um, one of his favorite, one of my favorite quotes of his, he had, I have a lot of favorite quotes from him, but one of his, when his people say that even for the gym, you know, I'm too out of shape or I'm too inflexible to do yoga. Mm -hmm. He says, would you ever say you were too dirty to take a shower? <laughs> right? I love that. Right? He's so good. I'm like, and then you just go, oh, right. Okay. I sound crazy. <laughs> I think I think um, I, I love that. I think that that is a great way to sort of wake people up to that. My brain says my wife would say, "Yeah, you're too dirty to use our our regular shower. Go downstairs <laughs> to the other shower, and then you can clean that one up." But don't don't you dare go to the regular don't shower. Don't mess up my bathroom. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So you do have an instance where you are too dirty not to take a shower. Just don't mess up the bathroom. Yeah. Well, the, but and, is, but the, the, the irony with that is I say I said it sort of playfully, but the, it's it's much like in life. Someone else might say someone else that's important to you might say, yeah, you are too dirty to take a shower. 
right? But the right? whole point of the shower is to get clean. And so it's it's it shows up where uh, you know a spouse, a friend, a family member, a supervisor, a boss, or whatever tells us that we can't do something, and then we believe that we can't or should. Oh my gosh, I have I have several. Is you just had me flash back to the eighties in high school <laughs> when my computer science teacher handed me an exam back. He said, "Wow, I'm surprised you passed that." I mean, like. Are you saying I'm stupid? Like, wh what does that mean? That's a terrible <laughs> teacher. <laughs> Come right? On. He didn't like me very much. I can't imagine why. But, um, and then I can remember my guidance counselor just saying, oh, maybe you should just go do this. Like, don't, you, don't try for something like that. Just go do this. I'm like, but that's not what I want to do. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> Luckily, and I know, was a stubborn kid, but. Like, a guidance counselor like that, would say something like that, probably coming from a position of, of wanting to spare you pain, right? Now, if they're a jerk, they're probably doing it to stream you into something that they think, you know, you should do because of, you know, the color of your skin or your background or religion or whatever. That would be a, a terrible, you know, guidance counselor. The, the still not so great guidance counselor, but good hearted is like, you know what? I don't want you to feel like you're going to be a failure. So why don't you just go and do this other thing? And you'll probably, you'll probably enjoy that. When in fact, you're like, no, 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 I really want to do this thing. And they're like, mm. and that happened to me actually in high school. It's like, you don't have the marks for that. And, and that's a, that's a tough thing when somebody who supposedly in the case of guidance counselor um, knows everything about all of these different schools and programs and streams and all the stuff they tell you no you you shouldn't do that you can't or you can't yeah and that carries through to you know or from our parents our peers our our girlfriends boyfriends spouses co-workers and whatever we allow the influence of others to hold us back when we should just see their their influence as information or as one data point that exists you know you know if my my wife says something or my mom says something that's a data point that exists but it doesn't have to be included in you know the formula of getting to what i want to get to right <clears throat> yeah i'd see um if someone important tells you you can't do something and you're at that stage in your life where you aren't don't have enough self-identity or you don't know and you believe them because of their place of authority or importance. And you can carry that through your whole life. I was listening to a podcast and I can't remember who it was. And he went through until he's like 30s, believing that he was bad at math. And then someone showed him that he wasn't. <laughs> but it was because a teacher once said to him, yeah. you're bad at math. It's just like, like my teacher, my computer science teacher thought I was bad at computer science because I, because I didn't want to write programs. Really, was the problem. But <laughs> yeah. um, and I guess it's like, how do you? I mean, this is I, this t comes back to coaching for me. It's like unpacking the stories that we still carry around. So I will tell. I will. I will be honest with people and you know have conversations about. Not whether they can or can't, but do they want to? Because do you really want? Because this is the reality of that situation. Even when I was in massage school, people all wanted to go become massage therapists on cruise ships. And I thought, have you thought about what the, that's actually going to look like day to day? It's not actually glamorous. <laughs> you know, you're not going to be up on the deck swimming in the pool. Yeah. You know, so it's like if you really want it, then I'm going to cheer you on and support you and figure out how to help you get it if it's not in the impossible bucket, the real impossible bucket. But um, yes, I just lost my train of thought again. I think. I, you know, I think with with <laughs> with with, um, with somebody who who has a goal um, that isn't thinking about going going towards that goal uh, with all of the information, then as a coach, yeah, part of our job is to uh, is to ask questions to make sure that they have as much information as they need to have to make the right choice. It's not about making the choice that we would make or that someone else would make, 
but to go in, as we say, with their eyes open, right? Yeah. Because just like that with the massage therapist who wants to go work on a cruise ship, they're, what they're moving forward with, it's almost like they have glasses and on the inside of the lenses, you have the picture that they're focused on, which is the glamorous, you know, the, the beautiful sunsets and the, you know, uh, excursions and the, you know, playing in the- They've got whatever. the travel brochure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and they're not actually imagining the full reality of it because maybe it, they will get those sunsets and the and whatever else and you know on the I'm sure it's not all bad but but you're like, not on vacation uh, with with well no it's not and and it shouldn't be because you're talking about going and doing something for work right so it's not a vacation um but you're probably going to be like you know eight decks below or whatever and and not seeing natural light most of the time and right. you know so it's there, <laughs> there is there are those sides of things and so when we ask questions like that we can help the client inform themselves of um, and, and, and going back to the balance, finding the balance of the positive anticipation with the reality and then saying, well, do you still want it? Yes. Okay. Well then let's put a plan together and help you get there. Yeah. So I was just thinking about, so, um, my philosophy of coaching is how can I best support you to help you get what will create your happiest, healthiest life. And that's kind of a really brief version, but I was, cause I, I know what yours is, but I want you to tell people what your philosophy of coaching is. Cause then I'm gonna post the, for people who think coaching is the most amazing thing in the world, I'm gonna post a link for them to go take your intro to coaching webinar. Awesome. Everybody should take it. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I mean, there, there's a lot of things that that I wouldn't necessarily call them philosophies of coaching or whatnot, but I think maybe not philosophy, but it's um, it's it's all about helping someone move from where they are to where they want to be, right? And that makes me either sound like a coach or maybe somebody who has a moving truck or something. But, <laughs> but it's it's and and you can wrap that analogy back into it. it's like, well, why would somebody need a moving truck? Because they want to go from somewhere that they are moving away from to somewhere they want to move towards. And, and, um, and that's what it, that's what it comes down to, right, is, is that we want to help our clients get what they want. Um, in some cases, get what they need, and sometimes it's get what they want, but uh, getting more out of life, right, and, and whether that's life in relationships or finances or career or whatever the, the case may be. The, the wellness, the wheel of wellness, all of yeah. the things. And I mean, part of my selfishness in being a coach besides the fact that it you know brings me joy but is i know that the more people i can help be that person that will go outwards and like ripple out into their family and their community so when they're being better then their relationships are better and then when their relationships are better and then she told two friends and she told two friends and she told two friends so I always feel like the more people I can help, that it'll, the ripples will be bigger. Yeah. You know, I, I, I love that because it's it's the paying it forward, right? Mm -hmm. Is uh, if we can help one person, then they're probably going to either uh, indirectly because of their, their, you know, happiness going to positively affect people around them, or maybe directly they're actually going to overtly help people achieve their happiness, you know? Um, but, you know, coming back to the to the notion of wellness, um, you know, which is which is in part why what we're here talking about is, you know, that what it what is what is wellness, right? It's it's the sense of ease. It's in some cases, people would say it's the absence of struggle, or the absence of illness, if you're looking at it from a strictly a health perspective. But it's being able to do the things that we want to do and not feeling constrained or held back or shackled by uh, someone else's thoughts or feelings or their perspectives on things. And so as coaches, we get to help people, you know, unshackle themselves or to make the, the potentially tough decisions to move on from something or someone to something or someone that's going to support them. And, 
it's amazing to me how when when we work with some clients for the first time that we're the first person in their entire lives and this could be an adult in their 40s 50s 60s we we might be the first person in their entire lives that actually has been dedicated to helping them achieve their hopes and dreams um, without an agenda of you know what we think our family should be doing or what you should do in a job or in a company or whatever it's purely about helping the, the client get what they want which is awesome yeah no agenda and no judgment right it's you want purple hair go have purple hair like <laughs> Just think of Ellen with her blue hair. She's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. All of these things are so good. We could talk all day, you know. Yeah, you we know could. I love You know I love talking to you. I'm going to post our little thing. But really, I mean, obviously, I think everybody on, on the planet should have a coach because um, it is that person outside of your, I don't know, story that you tell yourself and the stories that people tell you about yourself and can give you that um, perspective, a different perspective and help you and support you. I remember your Indestructible Human website said something about you were, the, you were a cheerleader. What did you call yourself? A cheerleader and a- cheerleader, uh, cheerleader and a drill sergeant. And a drill sergeant. <laughs> and we need both in life, yeah. right? Yeah, we do. I mean, really, we do. We need people who will cheer us on. We need the drill sergeant to kick our butts, you know, when when we need our butts kicked. And there's a few other roles that we play as coaches, right? And and in between the cheerleader and the drill sergeant is the, you know, the 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 person who's patient and the person who is encouraging, you know, and soothing and and you know depending on what kind of coach we are, we get to play all of those roles. Um, and sometimes I think for new coaches, they struggle with some of those roles. Mm -hmm. If they're naturally a cheerleader, they're really good at that, but then they struggle a little bit with the drill sergeant side of right. things. Or yeah, maybe they're a really good drill sergeant, but they're not talking to cheerleader. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's, help, it's helps having had siblings to, yeah. to switch yeah. roles. <laughs> oh my gosh. I have to give you so much gratitude for, cause I know that you're a super busy man. Um, so I have to like, thank you so much for coming and spending some time with me and sharing your wise words with me and all of my friends out in the internet world and on the podcast. And uh, you get the last word. Well, I'll say thank you to you for the opportunity. You know, I I love chatting about all this stuff. Um, you know, we all have our path that we're charting in our lives, sometimes consciously, sometimes uh, at a subconscious level, and we have an opportunity to to create more of what we want. And we can do some of that ourselves. We can do some of that with the help of others, like a coach. And ultimately, we have you know we have different beliefs, but we know for sure we have this life to live mm -hmm. and why not make the most of it for the time that we have oh my gosh such good last words you're the best thank you thank you so much rod you're very welcome i will i will talk to you again soon okay. <laughs> take That's care okay. bye bye